Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dylan. That was tremendous. Have your Bibles open in the book of Esther, chapter number 4. Esther, chapter number 4. As we look again in our story, account of Esther. You ever notice, men, that when you buy a box to assemble, that they always include extra parts? Extra screws, extra bolts. Any men ever noticed this before? Always extra things. Now, if you were to follow the instructions, maybe just maybe they'd have a purpose, but let's be honest, who needs instructions? They're for our wives to follow or to point out how we missed putting it together correctly. Honey, I thought this had a drawer on the front. Well, not anymore. It's one of them fake drawers now. I was here just a little while as a, as a youth pastor, and uh, I had a printer in my office that did not work correctly. So I decided, like any good 22-year-old, I'd just take it apart. So I took this printer apart, and I left the office, I left it on my desk. That night, Brother Dalton saw that, and he called me. He was in charge at the time of all the, all the computer things around the office, and I had just taken this thing apart, right? He called me and said, well, what do you think you're doing? And I said, well, I'm fixing the printer. And uh, he expressed his thoughts on, on my ability to fix the printer. Next day I got back to the office and I put this thing back together. And that printer worked for years. I got it back together again and there were one or two screws left over. Apparently that's what was holding up the whole process. <laughs> that when Xmark built this printer they added two extra screws and that stopped the paper from going through. And by removing those screws, boy that thing worked like a dream. Got to get those extra pieces out of there. Thank you. He said you did a great job. If you have a printer, bring it over and I'll take some screws out and see if it works for you as well. <laughs> Sometimes we find those things, we think, well, what's this for? This is useless. You know, there's some inventions in life that people have said appear to be useless. Some inventions that people weren't quite sure what was going on. In fact, I have a couple pictures of some. In fact, if I get the first picture, there's a walking sleeping bag. So you can walk from your tent to wherever else you want to go on your campsite. How useless is that? But that's not the most useless invention I found. Another one I found uh, was another walking one, but you need to take your goldfish on a walk. So you need a walking fish tank. Now I'll just tell you right now, if I see one of you, one of my friends, walking down the sidewalk with this, I'll tell you right now I'm taking a picture. And though I don't post to Facebook much, I will post to Facebook. I'll text the pastor, don't have him post to the church Facebook page. This will go viral if one of you walking down the street with one of these things. Take your goldfish on a walk. Another picture right there. This one's kind of scary. A laptop holder for while you drive. Now I'd be tempted. <laughs> How handy that would be. One, yeah, no hands on the wheel. I don't even know what's going on there. Useless invention. But I brought something else with me. We're up north, of course, last week in the Upper Peninsula. I went to, went to Whitefish Point. And on Whitefish Point, they have some beautiful rocks. And so I brought back with me a, a pet rock. I will sell you my pet rock. He's a good pet. He doesn't leave much problem anywhere he goes. He'll sit there. When you come back, he'll be right there, unlike your children. I remember when Johnny first learned how to roll. We were, used to be able to leave him, you know, by himself. And one day, Dream went to clean. She came back and he was gone. She couldn't find him. And he was about, what, maybe uh, eight months, a year old at the most. She looked, he'd rolled under the crib, hiding there against the wall. This rock won't roll anywhere. It'll stay right where you leave it. This rock uh, won't cost you anything besides after you purchase it. You have to feed this rock. It's quite a nice pet rock. Have you seen these pet rocks before? You can buy them in boxes. You can pay. You can pay for a pet rock. What kind of deal is that? Talk about useless. Talk about, I mean, what is this good for? Well, if I get in a jam, I could chuck it at something. David made good use of it. All right, but it probably wasn't this one. All right, it is smooth. You say, Brother Howell, where in the world are you going this morning? I'm glad you asked. Look at Esther, if you would, chapter number 4, verse number 14. Mordecai has been talking to Esther. He's challenged Esther to go before King Ahasuerus. 
Esther has expressed some doubts, some, um, some issues with going because she said, I've not been called 30 days, and if I go uncalled and Ahasuerus does not extend his staff, his golden scepter to me, I will be killed. And Mordecai responds with Esther chapter 4, verse 14, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. This morning, with the Lord's help, I want to preach about this idea. You have a purpose. You're not just a walking sleeping bag or a fish tank or a laptop holder or even a pet rock. Though sometimes that's what our minds or the devil, the world wants to tell us, that we're useless. That we don't have a purpose. You have a purpose. I have a purpose because God has called us to something. Don't believe that you have no reason for being here. It's not true. Don't believe that you're not important or that what you do and what you say is inconsequential. You have a purpose, a God-given purpose. A noted physicist who achieved fame for his contributions to quantum mechanics said this, when it comes to those things that are most important, who I am, where I come from, where am I going, and who is God and what is his will, science is deathly silent. Right now, we're surrounded by science, are we not? Every day we turn the news and hear more science. Science is not bad. All right, science can be helpful. But science will not give us our purpose. God gives us our purpose. And this morning, with God's help, we'll look at Esther and our purpose. Lord, I ask you to help us during these next few moments. Lord, help me to say those things that would be profitable, that would be helpful, Lord, that true to your word. Lord, help us to know that you've called us to something. Lord, something powerful, something great. Lord, may we fulfill the purpose you called us to. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. The scary thing to not have a purpose. A scary thought to not know what you're doing where you're going, why you're here, or what God's called you to. But I can tell you without a shadow of doubt that God has called us to something today. He's called us to a purpose. In this passage, Mordecai is talking to Esther. He's challenging Esther. He's telling Esther, listen, you have a purpose. Who knows that God has not called you and put you in a spot for such a time as this. Each of us are in a different spot, different family, different friends, different uh, place of business, different work, different neighborhood. There's different people that you will reach that I'll never reach. Different people that I will know that you'll never know. God has called us to a purpose. He's gifted us with different talents. Not everyone can sing like Brother Dalton. And not everyone can find the extra screws like I can. Some of you are excellent with your hands, some with your voices, some with your minds, some with finances. And God has gifted you and talented you, but God has called us to a purpose. Children, God's called you to a purpose. Boy, on vacation, we had a great time, like I mentioned, with the family. And it's always intriguing to see each of the kids with their own unique set of talents and skills. One thing we got into while we're up north is Frisbee golf. Frisbee golf. Anybody ever played disc golf, frisbee golf before? There's a course in Frankie Muth. We played it yesterday. Quite enjoyable. And, and, and as a family, we've enjoyed competing against each other. Life is a competition. All right? And we split up into teams. Thank you for the amen out there. I heard that. We've had a good time with that. Interesting to see who can throw a frisbee well and who should probably look for something else to do in life. <laughs> purpose. There are little purposes. And, and uh, there are certain things that I shouldn't do. I should not do woodwork. Well, some of you men and ladies as well can, can take wood and cut it and, and, and shape it and, and refine it. It looks so beautiful. I told you my motto, you had to measure twice, cut three times, and go to Home Depot, buy another piece of wood. But I'm talking not today just about little talents like that. I'm talking about a bigger purpose in life, what God has called us to. For Esther, Mordecai says this was maybe the time that God has called you, the one single time that God has called you and put you in this place. We'll look this morning at three keys to understand what God is doing in a purpose for us. First of all, I see the path. 
I see the path this morning. If you look at the beginning of verse number 14, where Mordecai says, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time. You know, the Bible says sometimes it is good to wait patiently for the Lord. Lamentation, Lamentations 3, 26. But sometimes God has called us to act upon what we know, to do what he's called us to do. You see, David had to sling a stone. J.L. had to pick up a nail and a hammer. The disciples had to cast the net on the other side. And sometimes our lack of purpose is just fear or laziness. Sometimes there's no purpose because we're just afraid. Sometimes there's no purpose because we're just lazy. I heard about the guy who, got, who lost his job. Rather than going looking for a new job, he stayed at home in his house and prayed that God would bring him one. What would you tell a guy like that? You'd tell him to get out the door and find a job, would you not? You'd say, go put some, go, go put some applications, would you not? Well, sometimes our lack of purpose is really just laziness. You see, what, what uh, Mordecai is telling Esther here is don't be at a standstill. This isn't the time to back down. Can I tell you, Christian, can I tell you, friend, in 2020, in Saginaw, Michigan, in, in May, in April, June, July, and August, we're not trying to stand still. We're trying to move forward with purpose for God's kingdom and purpose for God's call. We want this church to move forward. God wants this church to move forward. We've seen fit to add some new ministries. What a blessing in the First Baptist Church. We've seen some new people come to church. What a blessing for the Lord at First Baptist Church. God wants us to not be at a standstill. There's a path. We can't be at a standstill. The story is told about General Stonewall Jackson. Am I allowed to say that name in 2020? All right, well, it's true. He was a general. Out of one of his famous campaigns, he was found himself with his army stuck on one side of the river. But he needed his whole troops and army and supply wagons to be on the other side. He called his engineers and asked them to plan and build a bridge so the army could cross. And then he called his wagon master, as the story goes. Soon as possible, the wagon master started gathering all the logs, rocks, fence rails he could find. He built a bridge. And long before the light of day... General Jackson was told by his wagon master that all the wagons and artillery had crossed the river. General Stonewall Jackson then asked where the engineers were, and he was told they were still in the tent designing a bridge to get across. Now, I'm all for engineers. We had a good engineers designing our parking lot when we get that, able to get that done in the water flow. But there's time to do that, and there's time to stop being in a standstill. Mordecai is telling Esther, it's time to get up. All right, it's time to get out of your little house and to go see the king. You have a purpose. You have a job to do. It's time to do something. Don't be at a standstill, but don't be silent. Too many Christians are silent. Silent when they're with that co-worker. But what do they need? They need the gospel of Jesus Christ. What will they think, Pastor? What will they think when they're not going to heaven? What will they think when they find out that you had the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and you said nothing? Don't be silent. Don't be silent when they're telling those filthy jokes. Cat's got your tongue. Don't be silent. Don't be silent when people are being critical. Don't be silent. Now's not the time to be silent. God will make it plain when it's time to move. A few years back, the Lord brought us a house. You may remember the story, but I'll remind you of it. We were not looking for a house. About a year before we transitioned as pastor here, and I told my wife, I said, Honey, we'll wait about a year and a half, and then we'll look for a house, a forever house, we called it. One night, we're on a date. Now, my wife's Zillow feed, ladies, you find out what Zillow is, a real estate app. This house pops up in Bridgeport. We're on a date, just the two of us, kids are home with a babysitter, and, and uh, she said, honey, can we drive past it? I should have said no. Someone should have warned me. I said, why not? I'm on a date with my wife. We can drive past it. We drive past the house. She goes, look at that, honey. It's got a, it's got a pole barn in back. Like, like that would tempt me. <laughs> it's got a pond. She goes, honey, can we walk through it with a realtor tomorrow? I should have said no said, honey, you know we're not buying a house for at least a year, but if you want to walk through, I'll walk through with you. <clears throat> we put a bid on, it on that Monday. 
While in the, in the process of getting this house, that was in, I believe, August, we closed down it. Well, I'll tell you, we closed down in a minute. She asked me, she goes, aren't you excited? I said, no, not even a little bit. I know what this house is going to take to get it ready. We've done a few houses now and, and be able to, you know, re, redo a few houses. I think we've done four or five now. I said, I know what this looks like. We're going to end up moving on Christmas. I know this is the way it's going to happen. I said, I'm not excited, but if God is in it, then I want to be in it. We begin to pray, and God showed it so plainly, so clearly. There's things that we prayed for specifically, and God worked out beyond a shadow of a doubt. You see, when God is in it, He'll make it plain when it's time to move, literally and figuratively. By the way, we ended up moving on December the 22nd. Many of you helped us that day, and we moved that house in just about three hours. What a blessing you were to my life. We had no Christmas tree. And I'm a big Christmas fan. We usually have five or six Christmas trees in our house. We went to Home Depot that night, Saturday night, the 22nd. And uh, they gave us trees. We bought one. They said, we'll take the rest of them. No one will buy them before Christmas now. They weren't the best Christmas trees. They're little Charlie Brown trees. But I think we had five or six trees that year. You see, when God's in it, he'll make it plain when it's time to move. Right now, we're not running buses at First Baptist Church. We will. We will. Don't worry. We're praying about that. And we'll see when God opens that door again. But we've been praying for some new buses. About two and a half weeks ago, the Lord brought us some other buses at First Baptist Church. You know, you say this COVID-19, it's a, it's a bad time, but I'll tell you, the Lord's using it to make it a good time. We found a place at some buses in another school district. Typically, these buses are bought by other school districts who buy from this school district, and they'll drive them for 10 or more years. You know, because of COVID-19, the other districts aren't buying the buses. So we got them. Praise God. He'll make it plain. You see, there's a path, and God will make it plain. Don't be like the old Scottish woman. She went from home to home, across the countryside, selling thread and buttons and shoestrings. And whenever she'd come to an unmarked crossroad, she'd throw a stick in the air, and wherever the stick landed, that's the way she'd go. But when you know it, one day she was seen tossing the stick up and down several times. Finally, someone asked this old Scottish lady, Ma'am, why are you tossing this stick again? She goes, Because it keeps on pointing to the left and I want to go to the right. <laughs> and that's how we are sometimes in life with the Lord. Lord, I know which way you're pointing, but I want to go this way. You know, there's a path. So we find God's purpose. Not only that, there's a plan. There's a plan in God's purpose. If you look in verse 14 again, where it says, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Understand something that God's design cannot be thwarted. God's design cannot be thwarted. There shall enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. You see, Scripture is filled with the power of God. Proverbs 21, verse 1, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. You may feel like no one's in control right now, but I'm here to tell you, my friend, that God is still in control. He knows what's going on in this crazy world right now. He is still in control. I don't know what tomorrow holds. I don't know what today holds. I don't know what it'll look like next week. But I know this, God is still in control. His design cannot be thwarted. He wasn't surprised by COVID-19, nor was he surprised by the murder hornets. God is still in control. If it's not that or murder hornets, it'll be something else. Until God comes back, this world's only going to get worse. It's not going to get better. But he is still in control. You have a purpose because God is in control. You know, he wants to be in control of your life. Let me make it plain. So let him. So let him. He wants to be in control of your life. God's design cannot be thwarted. Ephesians 1 tells us in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. My friend, God will do what God will do. You can't stop God. Nothing you can do can stop God. The government can't stop God. No person can stop God. The church will still move forward. The gospel will still save lives. God's word will still accomplish truth. You can't stop God. If you look in the Bible, and the Bible is an amazing book. Not only is it true from cover to cover, it's a lot of fun to read. There's some amazing things. You'll find out that God one time used a mirage 
He used a mirage. We're up north driving down the, the road there in the Upper Peninsula. We saw a mirage on the road and I told the kids, hey, you know that God used that one time. Kids hadn't heard that story yet. So I looked it up in 1 Kings, I think it's chapter 3. Read the time about where God used the water in the desert to look like blood and scare everybody half to death. God can use a mirage. He used a mirage. He was the first inventor of the murder hornets. He used hornets. He used water, wind, and fire. He moves mountains, magistrates, and men. God is in control. His design can't be thwarted. You say, well, pastor, you don't know my life. You're right, I don't, but God does. You don't know how bad my life is. You're right, but I'll listen to it. I really will. I was at Jack's Fruit Market yesterday, and the lady asked how it was going. I said, it's great, I can't complain. My normal response. She goes, oh, that's good. I don't complain either. I said, good, because you know what? You can't change it, and no one really cares. It's the truth, isn't it? All right? You know, but I'll listen to you. I will. I'll smile and nod. Oh, that's tremendous. Oh, that's horrible. Whatever you need, you just push the button. No, no, I'll listen. But I know someone who will listen all the time. His name is God. His design can't be thwarted. He's in control. He can move the mountains. So your little problem's no problem for him. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills, so your little bill problem, no problem for his money. He's a great physician. He's a great physician. So what do I have to fear? I want to please him. You see, God can move mountains, magistrates, and men. He is the maker of all things, and he can move anything he wants. God's design can't be thwarted. Mordecai says, Esther, listen, if you don't do this, God will still do what God will do. But Esther, you're going to miss it. My friend, God will still do it, but I don't want you to miss it. I don't want to miss it. I want to stand before the Lord one day, and I want him to say this, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You ever have that thought that you wonder if God will say that to you? I used to kind of think, boy, there's little chance of that happening. I know me, I'm a mess up. You ever think that? But if you read that account of the parable of the talents, you know that two-thirds, two guys got the good speech, only one guy got the bad speech? That means that more were faithful that were unfaithful. That means there's a chance that I can be faithful for the Lord. I can do it with His grace and help. You see, God's design cannot be thwarted. But don't miss this. Our decisions are really important. Mordecai says to Esther that if you're not careful, your father's house shall be destroyed. If you remember that Mordecai was Esther's uncle, he was telling Esther, listen, if you make the wrong decision, if you, if you flake out here, if you operate in your fear, if you don't follow what God has called you to do, understand something, Esther, there will be consequences. Dads, a lot of responsibility on our shoulders. A lot of responsibility. Decisions that I make affect my family, my wife, and my kids. When I stand before the Lord one day, I can't blame my wife. Can't do it. And neither can you. Neither can you. Adam tried that. Lord, the woman thou gavest me. Lord, it's really your fault. Because you gave me this model. Eve. That's what he says. Eve says, this is a snake. And the Lord in Genesis says, no, 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 no. It's your fault. The decisions that we make are really important. Esther, if you're not careful, you're going to make a bad decision here. You're not going to fulfill your purpose. You're going to operate in your own fear rather than faith. And Esther, choose to believe God. You see, there's a path and there's a plan, but there's a purpose. And that last little phrase in Esther chapter 4, verse 14, And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? If you know the end of the story, as we get into it in the next few weeks, you know that Mordecai was right. This is why Esther was here, right? Esther goes to the king and the whole thing works out. Boy, what a happy ending, right? Except for Haman. Not so good for him. But that's why she was here, was it not? That was her purpose. But she didn't know it. She didn't know it, did she? She didn't know the rest of the story. She didn't know the ending. She only knew the next step. 
See, God has created you for a purpose. We need to find it. The glory of God means to glorify Him. The salvation of souls is the real business of life. You say, you may be here in God's economy for such a time as this. You're not here, I'm not here, just to work a job and die. I'm glad there's more to life than that. I'm glad there's more than just working and dying. I tell you, there's a rat race of life. Up north, we were able to pull aside for a few days. The best part about being up north was no cell phone coverage. It was a blessing. I take that back. About every four or five hours, a text would randomly find its way to my phone. And I could drive about five minutes and find cell phone coverage. I drove there once or twice. It's nice not having your phone on you, is it not? Things like a tether, it's like a leash. Boy, I'm glad there's more to life than this rat race. With every fiber of our being, he has a perfect plan. He knew how tall you would be or how short you'd be. He knew how smart you'd be or how not so smart. He, know, he knew your sense of humor. He knew how your mind would work and wouldn't. God formed you according to his perfect plan. Jeremiah, God says to him, And before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet into the nations. God has a purpose for you. You say, well, pastor, I don't know what it is yet. You're right. Just take the next step. For Esther was going before the king. That was the next step. That's the next step of purpose. Esther would never have found out the end of the story if she'd not taken the next step. And the Lord made it really clear to Esther. It came through Mordecai. Most things in life are pretty clear. What should you do today? We should come back to church tonight. Pretty clear. You should probably eat lunch today. It's pretty clear. For lunch, you should probably pray and thank the Lord for the food. If you're at a restaurant, you should hand a gospel tract to the waiter or waitress, should you not? If you'll get gas, you know, the gospel tract out, you should, if you're me, take a nap in the afternoon. That's the Lord's will for your life. Come back to church with a good spirit, anticipating what God has for us. Tomorrow morning, what should you do? It's easy. The next step, you get up and you do what God has called you to do. If he's called you to a job, you go there and you be faithful. If you're, if you're working on a line at GM, then be the best line worker you've ever been that they ever had at that plant. If you're working at a gas station, then bring up people the best way you can. It's a, just the next step. God created you for a purpose. You say, well, pastor, sometimes I feel like this rock. I tell you, my friend, that's not from God. That's not from God. God didn't make any people to be rocks. He made you to be a purpose. Oh, he made some rocks, and they have a purpose, asked David. But God created a purpose. And lastly, God put you in a place. Fulfill it. Martin Luther, not, he nailed 95 theses to the Catholic church door. Another man was quietly studying well, he did that. God called him for that purpose. David was, uh, was watching the sheep before he was called from the sheep to be anointed. God called him for a purpose. Whatever God's called you to, do it. Romans 8, 28 says this, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. John Wesley said this, I want the whole Christ for my Savior, the whole Bible for my book, the whole church for my fellowship, and the whole world for my mission field. Or we'll say it this way. Put all your eggs in one basket, then watch that basket. As long as God holds that basket, it'll be a good basket. God has called you to a purpose. Find it. Psalm 139 says this, Thine eyes did see my substance. Yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God, how great is the sum of them. Being a dad, having three kids. I told you I saw their talent in the frisbee golf, or lack thereof. It's neat to see the different talent that God has given them. Different ways they're maybe uh, akin to, or attuned to different, different ideas. I have one child who's very emotionally uh, intelligent. They can feel an emotional situation. Maybe you have a child like this. They can feel when someone's sad or happy. Other kids, not so much. Other kids are excellent with thinking through a problem, and some, not so much. And as a dad, I can look ahead and say, boy, I could see where God could use this. I could see where God could use this. 
I could see where God could use this. And in just some small way, can you see how our Heavenly Father, that's what the psalmist says, can you not see how he sees us? He says, before you were formed, I knew the parts of you. I knew just how you would be. I knew just where you would be. I knew just how I wanted to make you. And I put you together just like I wanted you to be. Because you have a purpose. See, Esther, the reason she was there was because she was beautiful. That's why she was there. She was the prettiest one. God put her right there for a spot on that day. God has made you just like he wants you so that you can fulfill your purpose. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what's going on in your life, but God does. Just do what he wants today and you'll fulfill his purpose. Lord, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that you have not left us to just wander aimlessly. Lord, thank you that we can have a purpose in life. Lord, I wonder if there's someone here today who has wondered why maybe they're even here. Maybe they're a Christian and they've lost their path. Discouragement. Lord, sometimes when we don't see your hand, we're tempted to think that you don't care. Lord, you do care. What do we say, Pastor Howell, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, as you spoke, God spoke to me. As you spoke, God was speaking to my heart and, boy, Pastor, I need to stay on the purpose that God has for me. Maybe you've been discouraged about what God has called you to. Maybe you've just gotten on the path that God has called you to and you've been silent or standing still. I would say, Pastor, while you spoke, God spoke to me. Would you pray for me that I would listen to the voice of God in my heart today? Amen. 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 Who else? Slip your hand up, sit back down. Amen. God spoke to me while you spoke. I wonder if you're here today and maybe while I was speaking, you realize that you don't have a home in heaven. You've never trusted Christ as your Savior. My friend, we'd love to open a Bible today and show you how you can know for sure that God loves you and Jesus died for you. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. My friend, you can trust Christ today. You can believe that Jesus died on the cross, that he was buried and rose again. He died to pay for your sins. And the Bible says if you trust in Jesus, believe on him, that you will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from separation from God. Saved from paying for your own sin. I wonder who would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven. If I die today, I don't know that I'd go to heaven. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? I'm not sure, but I'd like to be sure. If you slip your hand, I'll slip back down. I'll draw no more attention to you than I did anyone else. But I'd love to pray for you. Who would say that, Pastor? I'm here today. I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven. Would you pray for me? Just slip your hand up, slip back down. Amen. I see that hand. Who else? Lord, I pray you'd guide this invitation. Lord, may we look to you, find our purpose. I don't know if we're the one who said they're not sure they're saved. Lord, would they come and trust you today? In Jesus' name. So we stand to our feet. The head, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. The piano's already playing. The Lord's dealt with you. Would you come now? Folks up here, come to get baptized. We'd love to have someone pray with you.